to another episode of Pink Perspectives, powered by the Pink Tabletop. I'm your host, Dana Johnson, and joining me today via Zoom is my new friend and fellow advocate, Valencia Robinson from a suburb in Florida. Thank you, Valencia, for joining me today. Thank you for having me. It's a pleasure. I appreciate it. Just to give our audience a little backstory on how we met, So about a little over a week ago, Valencia and I attended a public policy committee um, meeting in Washington, D.C., and we both were there as representatives for the National Breast Cancer Coalition. It was a pleasure to get to know her and hear a little bit about her story and her journey as a survivor. So I asked her if she would be willing to be um, an episode, a guest on my podcast. So today I'd just like for you to share with our audience um, who will be watching us via YouTube and other platforms today, a little bit about your story. So tell us a little bit about yourself. Okay, so I'm gonna go right into the breast cancer story. I was diagnosed at the age of 33. I was a high school teacher. And my children were three, four, five, and eight. So I went in for a routine gynecological visit. And the midwife who had delivered three of my children, she felt the lump on my breast. I was not doing my self breast exams because, yeah, I don't know why. I was busy. And you know, one thing that I talked to my mother about growing up, it wasn't something that my mother ever told me to do. I can't ever recall her telling me when I got of age, when my cycle started to to check my breast for lumps, never. But having said that, I know once I started having children, when I would go in for my doctor's appointments, I know the doctors were, you know, feeling around and probably telling me to check, but I still wasn't doing it. So when I was when she felt the lump, she said, it's probably nothing. It's probably nothing, but let's, let's get you a, a mammogram. So she asked about my family history. And to my knowledge, I did not really have a family history of breast cancer, but she kind of told a little fib because she said at the age of 33, they're probably, probably going to say, let's just watch this for six months. And she's like, I don't want to do that. Now, this is the nurse midwife, not even the OBGYN. This is the midwife. But I had a great relationship with her because, you know, having four kids, I was in there a lot. So, um, but I'm so grateful to her. I'm so grateful that she pushed it. She did not let me leave her office until I had that mammogram scheduled. I love it. I love it. Yes. Did you yes. show the significance for all of you who may be watching who are midwives? We appreciate our our doctors wholeheartedly and our you know our gynecologists and things of that nature. But with midwives, as you said, and nurses share a very, very important role. So yes, Absolutely. thank you for pointing that out. Absolutely. So um I was diagnosed October 31st, 2006. That was the diagnosis date for me. I went in for the mammogram and then I was called back for the um, biopsy. And and the whole time I'm thinking, I'm okay. You know, I'm thinking they're not going to find anything. You know, I'm thinking to the point that I left school one day, we got out of school at 245 and I went to the doctor's office. They, They called me and said they needed, we needed to have an appointment. It didn't even relate. That they're going to be telling me at this appointment that I had breast cancer. My husband had picked up our five-year-old and eight-year-old because they were in school. The other two were in daycare. He picked them up and brought them to the appointment. It's like, who does that? Yes. So my kids were there when I was told I had breast cancer. And it, it was just a whirlwind of emotions and, you know, it, 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 was, it was a lot wow. being a classroom teacher, having four children. It was a lot, but I had to pull myself together and I had to, you know, educate myself. Then the true education started. I'm reading and I'm learning, you know, what, what are the next steps? And then the, the team of doctors, they were, they were very, very 
you know, good as far as like, you got to get the lumpectomy, you got to start treatment right away. Um, I did have to change doctors. So here's a, a lesson learned as well. So I was, um, I knew I had to have the lumpectomy and they wanted to put the port in, you know, they were going to do all of that at the same time. And, but the oncologist, I just wasn't vibing with him. He's, he's talking to me, but yet he's not talking to me. It's like he was talking at me Got it. and I'm like, um, no, there is no, and I went through the chemo class there, went back there. I saw all the people, um, older people getting their chemo. Remember I'm 33 at the time. And, and then I did the chemo class at this particular hospital. And this is what really shocked me. They had everybody in this class. Some people had colon cancer. Some people had lung cancer. And they're going from person to person to person telling them, okay, you're going to have this drug and this and this and this. It was not personalized. When I left that, I said, no, ma'am. No, sir. You people are not going to give me any drugs. And they're like, but, but your cancer is really, really bad. I didn't know what type of cancer I had. Okay. I had no idea. They're just like, it's really, really bad. As if you couldn't tell me the specifics of my cancer. That wasn't done. So my kids had a lot of allergies, asthma, um, celiac disease. So I went to the health food store a lot. I knew the owner of the health food store. So I went there and I'm like, Mitch, I need your help. I have breast cancer. They're telling me I have breast cancer, but I cannot get treatment at this hospital. I said, I refuse. I was like, I know you have something. There is something I can be taking in the meantime until I get another doctor. So Mitch, his wife, he begins to tell me about his wife and her cancer. And he's like, I have the doctor for you. So um, oh I love the relationship. I'm all about relationships and having that personal connection and you knowing his wife and knowing his name just probably just set a completely different tone for you and allowed you to, to be able to manage a little bit easier. Yes, yes, yes. But he told me uh, my doctor was Dr. Karen Bigman. He said, you have to see Dr. Karen Bigman. You have to see her. And I'm like, okay, okay, I'm going to. So I got, I had um, asked for my medical records, not knowing that I was going to see someone else. So I called Dr. Bigman's office. She was out of the country and her, her receptionist was like, uh, she's probably not going to see you because her partner, the lady who she shared offices with another doctor she had passed away. So she's like, she's taken over her patient. She's like, I don't think she can see you. And I'm just like, but that is not for you to decide. I say, here are my medical records and I will just wait for her to call me. I said, so it was great. She came from her, her trip and she saw my medical records because I took them to the office. And she, these are the things that she told me that was a red flag for her and why I had to be her patient. She saw African-American, 33-year-old, triple negative breast cancer. Oh my the God. doctors before me had never said that I had tri triple negative breast cancer. Now, had they told me that, I probably wouldn't have known what that was. Right. I wouldn't have known what that was. Okay. Right. But tell me, you know what I'm saying? I can do research. I can connect with other people and see, this was 2006. Mm -hmm. So 2006 was when triple negative was just being, I don't want to say discovered, but it was right. more and more people were being diagnosed with this triple negative breast cancer. African-American women were being diagnosed and the treatment plan was such that they really didn't know how to treat triple negative disease. So um, now I, I understand the hesitation from the first doctor, but he still should have informed me. Yeah. So this doctor, when she came back in the country, she called me for an appointment. I had an appointment with her by myself. No one 
this was before she even opened her office back up for all of her um, other patients. So the day that I went, because I guess she knew it would be a lot for, for, for me to understand and for her to tell me everything. Because this is not something you can tell a patient in 15, 20 minutes. Oh, for sure. You need a couple of hours to talk about everything. I love that, that she realized your need. And especially with you being in your early 30s. And there's so many times that we hear, oh, well, you should, you know, go in and get your mammogram at the age of 40. Like yes. that is that's the window. So the fact that she realized and allowed you to be able to have that time is yes. amazing. Yes, yes. So I went in for that appointment and she talked to me like I was her daughter. She told me the statistics. She told me that I may not make five years. She just, she was brutally honest, but she said, but I'm going to do everything I can to do for you. She said, I'm treating you just like my daughter nice the most gracious doctor ever so i was in her office alone with my family members and she walked me through everything that i was going to have to endure for the next eight months with my treatment plan and she went as far as to talk to me individually okay. when to start um what day to start my chemo on because i was going to continue to teach Okay. So we came up with the system. Monday, I would go to school. After school Monday, I would come in for my chemo treatment. Tuesday, I would come back. I would go to work. After school Tuesday, I would get my new last shot. Wednesday was early release day. So Wednesday, I would go to school, work that half day, and then I would be free from students. And then Thursday and Friday were my days to take off so that I could have my energy and strength, you know, so that on the weekend, I could have that time with my children because my kids were in school Thursday, Friday. So that is what people need. People yeah. need an individualized treatment plan. Exactly. They don't need to be in a room with all these other patients and they're telling you. And, and see, the other thing about it is she was she only deals with breast cancer. Okay. So the other hospital that I went to, it was a hospital. So of course they deal with all cancer. True. But going to her private office, she is a breast cancer specialist. So that is what, if people can find that, that's what they want. They want to go to someone who only is dealing with breast cancer, not other types of cancers, you know, but you know, it may be difficult to find that, but she was amazing. Oh. And my, yeah, my, my, she told me my hair would fall out after my very first treatment. She's like, you need to go get a haircut. So I got a haircut and she was like, I mean, you need to get your hair shaved off like your husband. I'm like, oh my God, that was traumatic. Okay. Cause when she said haircut, you thought, okay, haircut and just went low. Yeah. Just give okay. a little short bob. And right, right, right. No, no, no. She said it's going to be less devastating okay. if you have it completely cut. And I wasn't ready for that. Right. I wasn't ready for that. And then I had to go find some wigs. I wasn't ready for that either. You just, you just can't find the right wig and nothing is like your own hair. Oh, for sure. For sure. For sure. So I, I had friends with me during those times and, you know, and when you think about it now, look at my hair. No, you look you know, it's like, oh my gosh, like you rock it, like nobody's business. You would never know Not that all. I went through what I went through at all, no. at all, because it's, it's, it's one of those things, you go through the journey, you pray, and you do your best to um, stay positive, mm -hmm. because there were some days. There were some moments when I, I'm like, God, why me? I got these four babies. You know, why? It's like I'm living through my kids and their issues with their food allergies and their celiac and their asthma. It's like, we don't need another thing in this household. No one else needs to be sick in my house. Right. But now I see from going through my journey, my sister was diagnosed 10 years after me. Oh, my gosh. Yes. 10 years. And, and, and let me tell you, this is how 
aggressive my cancer was, you know, most people get their port out, right? Mm -hmm. 10 years later, when my sister was going through treatment, my sister had finished her treatment. She got her port out before me. My port was still in. Then I'm like, doctor, I want this port out. I was like, my sister has gone through breast cancer. And now I still have this port. And then we, I had the surgery to remove my port. But the, she, she was like, if it's not bothering you, let's keep it. Because she's like, well, this is what she told me. If I make it past five years, okay. then chances are I'm good to go. So I exceeded the five years and then the 10 years. And now it's been 15 years. Oh, so, bless your heart. Yeah, it, it, it's really a blessing to see um, to see my life now. Because when you're going through the journey, you have no idea. You're just like, why me, God? Why me? But now when I see, I, like I spoke at a church yesterday and I was sharing my testimony with them. And that just gave so many people hope for family members that, that are going through the journey and just a way to connect with people on a personal level who yes. need assistance, you know, and I do a lot of things in my area where I, I'm, people are calling me all the time about so-and-so was just diagnosed and so-and-so needs this. And now I see the big picture of this is my purpose. This is the plan that God has for my life because you got to have people to exactly. help exactly. Exactly. navigate through the, the, their, their diagnosis. You know, there, there's so much people don't know. Even now, you know, I'm thinking back to my life in 2006, how naive I was. Mm -hmm. and, and, and until someone experiences this, they just, they're not keeping up with what's happening in the cancer world. They're not reading medical journals. They're not, you know, going to conferences like you and I, where we met. People aren't doing that because there's no need. But when they get diagnosed, that's our job to, to learn so that we can be better advocates for people. And, and it's just great to do the things that I do now. Well, I appreciate you so much. And I'd like to just transition since you mentioned um, how we met uh, to just have a little bit more in-depth conversation about what you do with the um, Breast Cancer Coalition in Florida, as well as your role with the National Breast Cancer Coalition, um, in short, in BCC, and um, what, you, what you've learned and what you've gained as an advocate there. Um, I, I would have never realized the extent of your story until you and I had an opportunity to, to share over dinner and then again over breakfast and you exude just happiness and positivity and all of that. So hearing your journey, like I'm grateful that that doctor came into your life and that we still have you here, you know, here we are 15 years later. So yes. if you could um, share a little bit about what you do in Florida and what you do for the national level as well. Okay. So um, there was a lady here in Florida she kept saying, Valencia, we need you to come speak. And, and so I started doing a lot of things right here at churches, you know, okay. at community events, at symposiums. And I just gave you guys a short segment of my story. It, it's much longer. Oh, for but sure. For me, talk, too. <laughs> <laughs> but for me, just sharing um, at the local events, there was one lady, she's like, Valencia, we need you to get trained with the National Breast Cancer Coalition. We need you to go to Project Lead. We need you to help with Coleman. We need you to do grants. And I'm like, look, I, I have four children. What I'm not going to do is, you know, get through all of this treatment and then become busy, 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 busy doing all of this work. No. And I had to raise my children. And then I was still teaching. I was teaching in the classroom. There's not enough hours in the day to go from a full-time job, to come home to four children, and then to do all of these things that she's asking me to do. So for years, I'm just like, no, I will go to the support meetings because it, they were good. They were at the radiologist's office and they would have like a dinner for us. So I'm like, this is my little... This is my time to meet with other patients and to just learn even more. So it started at those support group meetings, right? And I was the youngest person there always. 
and we would gather around Christmas. So this lady, every time she saw me once a month, she's like, we need you to do this and we need you to do this. And I'm like, Jerry, I'm not doing any of this stuff. But as my Jerry at the helm of the council that you sit on, what's the name of the organization? Okay, so I'm on the Florida Breast Cancer Foundation. I'm a part of the Florida Breast Cancer. I'm, I'm, I'm in fact a board member. Okay. For the Florida Florida Breast Cancer Foundation. And before I became a board member, I would, they would need people to um, look at grants that people submitted, you know, they want funds for their small nonprofits. So I did grant review. I did a lot of small things that I could do, you know, from home. Okay. And then that catapulted me to being a member on the board and once I became a board member, she's like, you, you really need to do this project lead with the National Breast Cancer Coalition. So I'm like, okay, because the kids are getting older now. So I can spend a week in California. Who doesn't want to spend a week in California? Of course, of course, of course. Uh, it, was, it was fantastic, though. It was fantastic because people from all over the United States came. And it was very selective, you know. I so when I was selected... I felt like, yay, I'm just getting this great prize. And the, um, so I attended with the, the um, president of our organization. He and I attended together. Okay. So the president of the Florida Breast Cancer Foundation, his wife had just passed from metastatic breast cancer. Mm-hmm. Yes. And I attended along with him and it was a great, six days science basic science of breast cancer so you're you're learning about immunology you're learning about all of the different types of breast cancer you're just learning so much i mean it is an absolutely wonderful course um it's it's so fast so you have doctors and clinicians and oncologists you have all of these people researchers coming in training patient advocates and it's, it's, it's a wonderful, wonderful institute. So after attending that, that's your number one thing. Once you attend Project Lead, then you can attend, you can be a reviewer for the Department of Defense. Review. Oh, wow. Yeah. I have no idea because Kathleen, as you know, sitting on a board for the National Breast Cancer Coalition, we kind of share a similar uh, story, you and I. Uh, with my son being young when I came on through the National Breast Cancer Coalition and through uh, Wisconsin Breast Cancer Coalition, they also would be like, you should do this and this and this and this and this. And there was just not enough time. So I am anxiously looking forward to my opportunity to attend Project Lead and having heard stories like yours and some of the other ladies. It just, even though it's completely science-based, it makes it worthwhile and interesting to be able to look forward to that opportunity. Yes, it, you will love it. And now that you've met several of the, the, the people, you know, from the National Breast Cancer Coalition, you, yes. you will already have a connection with them. Okay. I went not knowing anyone, but, and once you start working, you won't stop. That's the thing. It's been nonstop, nonstop. So when I was diagnosed, my kids were three, four, five, and eight. Now my kids are 18. 20, 21, and 23. Wow. My kids have attended conferences with me. Oh. It's not just the National Breast Cancer Coalition. It's living beyond breast cancer. My daughter, my 21-year-old daughter, she attended living beyond breast cancer with me in Philadelphia. And they, they give you stipends. Yes, because with me and my sister both having breast cancer, I need to start educating my daughter. She's in college and she needs to in turn educate her friends. So when you get the information, you are sharing it. My my younger daughter, we've done the Young Survivor Coalition in Orlando, Florida. So there's so many, yes, there's so many um, ways. My oldest daughter, she and I went to the Metastatic Breast Cancer Conference in Scottsdale, Arizona. Wow. She was in college, but they paid for her to come. Amazing, amazing, amazing. These children, the youth need to learn, especially, and I, I have another story that I have to share. 
Okay, yeah. you may have to end up putting that one in our part two, just so that we can- um, It's a short with one. Our, with our own. Um, I, I, I welcome you to continue to join me and we will definitely have a part two with, with Valencia so that she can continue to share because she has such a wonderful story to tell. And I just thank you for, for joining us today. Is there any, just a quick wrap that we can, that you can offer just from your personal experience where you can um, let people know why you feel like this podcast um, is worthwhile and a, uh, a benefit, whether the person is a, um, a caregiver, which I'm sure your husband became and your, um, your children or an advocate or survivor that you would like to share briefly. This is so important because, especially in the day of COVID, people are neglecting to, to get their mammograms. They're just neglecting their doctor's appointments, period. So this is a way, listening to podcasts, hearing stories, excellent way for people to say, hey, maybe I do need to go get that gynecological check. You know, maybe I do need to go take care of, you know, this mammogram. We cannot wait. African-American women are being diagnosed at a much faster rate. They have a higher mortality rate. And for our women, we have to take life. Life is so precious. We don't know how many days we have. So we have to live life to, the, to its fullest. But that means taking care of your body. Thank you, Valencia, again for joining me today for another episode of Pink Perspectives Powered by the Pink Table Talk. It was a pleasure being able to hear your story and to share your journey with you. I appreciate you. Thank you. This is wonderful. Thank you so much. Have a wonderful day. You too. Bye-bye. You can find us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter, and also on our YouTube channel, Pink Perspectives Powered by the Pink Table Talk. We look forward to you continuing the journey with us on my podcast and also look for my nonprofit at www.thepinktabletalk.org. Bye. The Pink Table Talk will be offering our fabulously scented, custom labeled Pink Table Talk candle. Each one hand poured by Cheyenne Candles as a symbol of continuous support to the causes and awareness of breast cancer. The candle light, we'd like to say, represents an eternal flame that will burn in memory to the lives lost and in commemoration to those who continue the fight with cancer and our never ending crusade to bring awareness. Proceeds from purchasing go to the building of the Pink Tabletop Advocacy and Outreach, as well as our ability to support other programs and agencies in kind. Thank you for joining us.